My name is Luz Gatigna. I'm a certified financial planner. I have been for most of my 30 years in the financial services business and um, the president of AFM Investments. It's a 30-year-old financial planning and tax firm in central New Jersey. It's one of the largest and oldest financial planning firms in the state. And I'm also the host of the Financial Physician Radio Program, which has been on the air for uh, 15 years in central New Jersey on WOBM AM 1160, and five years we were on XM Satellite Radio. And I'm also the author of The Financial Physician. This is my brand, The Financial Physician, known as uh, America's Money Doctor. And the subtitle of the book is How to Cure Your Money Problems and Boost Your Financial Health. Now, being a financial advisor for 30 years, I've seen thousands of people, and many of them are failing financially. They're broke. And the title of my speech today is 10 Reasons Why Most Americans Are Broke. And how do I define broke? I define broke as people who have no net worth or little net worth, which is most of Americans, unfortunately. It's a terrible situation that the richest country in the world has right now. And why is this? Let me give you some stats on, uh, on how people are broke. When asked, could you come up with $2,000 if there was an emergency, 40% of the country said they could not. $2,000 we're talking about. It's not a lot of money here. When asked, do you have six months living expenses put away in an emergency fund? Well, 65% said they did not. And we know what happens, especially in this economy, it's so easy to lose your job and be out of work right away. What happens if you have nothing saved? That's a scary stat. 65% of Americans really cannot support themselves for six months. 74% of Americans say that they're living paycheck to paycheck. Whether that's Social Security check to Social Security check or salary check to salary check, 74% of Americans are in that situation. And 49% of Americans are dependent on government for their income. Whether they be retired in Social Security, whether they're disabled, whether they're on welfare, whether they're on food stamps. That's a serious situation for a country when half the people are dependent on the government to eat and to pay their bills. So what are the 10 reasons why Americans are in this situation? Now, in my book, I use medical analogies to talk about finance. We talk about physical health. Well, second thing to physical health is financial health. And I found out in my career when I use medical analogies, people got it. When I said that credit card debt is cancer to the financial body, people got that. They knew what it meant. So in the book, I talk about the 20 financial ailments that affect Americans and my prescription on how to fix it. Let's talk about the first problem. First problem is financial illiteracy. We don't teach our kids in school about money, and this bothers the hell out of me. We teach them about mythology. We teach them about ancient history. We teach them about geometry. We teach them about things they'll never use in their life, but we don't teach them how a credit card works. We don't teach them how mortgages work. We don't teach them about income taxes. Why? I've never been able to get a good answer why schools don't do that. And because of that, kids graduate high school, they don't know anything about money, they get themselves in trouble right away with the credit cards, with buying cars they can't afford, and so forth. It's a big issue in this country, financial literacy. Most Americans, whether you're young or old, many people have no idea how to manage money. That's why they fail. They don't go out to fail, they just don't know any better because they've never been taught. And I believe that in high school there should be four years of personal finance taught and you have to pass every single year before you can graduate. Now, the good thing about that, now we're starting to see schools start to implement personal finance courses. And it took a lot of screaming and yelling, people like me, for boards of education to start instituting this. It's a good thing. The second problem we have is financial irresponsibility. You can't be personally irresponsible and not be financially irresponsible. They go together. What do I mean by financial irresponsibility? Yeah, it could be buying stuff that you can't afford. That's irresponsible. But how about this? I know somebody very close to me that both husband and wife smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. The husband drinks almost two six packs of beer a day. And you do the math, you're talking about $25 to $30 a day going to vices. How much is that a month? 
it's almost $1,000 a month. And they wonder why they can't save any money. They wonder why they have no net worth. And the reason why people have no net worth, it's an accumulation of bad decisions, bad financial decisions down the line. So you got to make personal responsibility and financial responsibility part of your life. Otherwise, there's no way you're going to succeed financially. Number three, feelings of material entitlement. Americans believe because we're Americans, we deserve to have the nicest cars, the biggest houses. Now, I remember when I was growing up, I'm the oldest of six kids. And we lived in a small Cape Cod with one bathroom. And you can imagine what it was like in the morning trying to get ready for school with one bathroom and two sisters. Right? But we got by. We had the same car. My father bought a station wagon in 1966. I was six years old. When I turned 17, it became my car. And I had it for a couple of years, and it became my brother's car. You don't see 12, 13, 15-year-old cars on the road anymore. You don't see clunkers on the road anymore. All you see is relatively new cars. Big problem, right? Again, feelings of, of entitlement that we deserve to live the best life possible whether we could afford it or not. And that's the key. There's nothing wrong with living a good life if you could afford it. If you're putting money away for uh, the future, for college or for retirement, then that's fine. You could have some entitlement. You could have a nicer house. Unfortunately, people who can't afford it are the ones that are going out there and buying those new cars and new houses. Another reason why people fail financially is because they don't understand their financial psychology. What goes on here? I've spent thousands of hours with clients in my conference room. Managing money from them is not a problem. Managing their head is a problem. Because nobody's more irrational about anything than money. It's not love, it's not religion, it's not sex. It is money. People go nuts when it comes to money. And people either have one or two attitudes that affect how they manage their money. A, an attitude of abundance, or B, an attitude of lack. And you know what? It has nothing to do with how much money you have. I have a client that has $2 million, and she has an attitude of lack. She's always worried that she's not going to have enough. Then I have clients with 50000 with me, never you worry about it, right? And the way your mind works will affect the way you manage your money. Some people are risk takers by psychology. They'll go out there, and they want the home run. And other people are squirrels, where they want to just put money away. They want it to be safe. And there's all kinds of people in between. I've narrowed it down to five people in the book. I don't have time to go over it now. But in the book, I have the five financial psychologies. And probably you, fill in, you fit into one of those. Another reason why most families fail financially and are broke is lack of spousal teamwork. Both husband and wife should be involved in the finances. Now, in most families, that's not the case. In most families, it's either the husband or the wife that handles the money. And then the other spouse sabotages them because they're not on the same team. They're not paying the bills. They're not worried about what's going on. I remember when uh, I was a teenager, my father used to pay the bills, and he was always stressed out about it, and finally he gave it to my mother. Now, he was never stressed out about it any, anymore. My mother was, all right? But both, I always say both you and your honey should manage the money together. You should have a monthly meeting when the kids are asleep and it's quiet and go over every bill and pay them together. One person writes a check, the other one licks the envelope. And you look at that bill, the electric bill, the credit card bills, the, the investments together every single month. And if you see that the electric bill is too high, you say, honey, let's do what we can to get $100 off this electric bill this month. And you know what? You're both investing in it. And you're both turning the lights off. You're both keeping the heat down. And when that bill comes next month, you're excited when you open it up and you see you've achieved your goal together. So important that husband and wife work together financially. And I tell you, in my practice, I've seen so many, mainly widows, where a husband dies, and now the widow has to handle the family finances. And in some cases, she's never written a check. That's irresponsible for a husband to do that to their wife, or vice versa. We're seeing now more and more women run the family finances, which I think is a really good thing, because women are better at it, to be quite honest with you. But again, the husband has to be engaged in that. Very, very important uh, issue, and I, I stress it uh, uh, quite a lot. Another reason why people fail financially and are broke is bad financial advice. Now, I'm in the financial services industry 30 years. I hate to say this, but most people in my industry are incompetent at best and unethical at worst. 
Why is that? Because most people in the financial services industry are not financial advisors. They're financial salesmen. They get paid commissions to give you investments. An example is annuities, which I hate. They pay the highest commissions. So many people push them on investors, and I think they're one of the worst investments out there. But I see it all the time. And I have a friend of mine in the business who tells, only sells annuities. And I ask him why. He says, because I make the most money. I said, who are you working for? You working for your client or are you working for yourself? All right. Most people, especially commission-based advisors, are salesmen. They don't understand the economy. They don't understand the markets. They don't understand risk management. And in 2008, when everything crashed, very few people got a call from their broker saying that we should make adjustments as this was happening. No, they didn't do that because they're looking for their next commission. A bad financial advisor is like having a bad doctor, to use a financial physician analogy. Just like you wouldn't go and, and, and take a 23-year-old doctor to operate on you, why would you have a 23-year-old quote-unquote financial advisor? Why wouldn't you go to somebody who has some gray hairs, who's been around the block, who's been through up markets and down markets? It don't cost you anymore. And another thing, it's, I think, an advantage to an investor to deal with a fee-based investment advisor versus a commission-based investment advisor. Why? Because you're on the same team. A fee-based investment advisor makes a certain percent of assets under management. If his client's accounts go down 10%, his income goes down 10%. If his uh, investments go up for his clients 10%, he goes up 10%. And there's no conflict of interest as far as commissions go because there's no commissionable products involved. And we're seeing the industry go more towards that. And I uh, would not deal with anybody that wasn't a certified financial planner. Certified financial planner is the top accreditation you can get in financial services. It takes a lot of study, usually two years. It's a two-day test. 30 hours a year of uh, continuing education is necessary to maintain that license, and it is the highest ethical structure. And certified financial planners understand corporate benefits, understand income taxes, understand estate planning, understand, understand investments, understand insurance. It's a comprehensive designation. And again, it doesn't cost you any more to deal with a certified financial planner versus somebody that just got out of college, took a test, and says, now I'm a broker. And I tell you, you're better off with no financial advisor than a bad one. All right, here's the big ones. This is the main reason why people are broke. Cars and houses. How many people buy a new car every three years? I can't tell you how many families I see where the husband and wife each are paying $400 a month for a car. Think about that. That's $800 a month for a car. It's ridiculous. That's like a, it was a mortgage payment not long ago, $800 a month. And people wonder why they don't have any retirement savings. The way to buy a car is to buy a car that's two or three years old, coming off of lease. That's the way I buy my cars. There's dealers that just specialize in liquidating leases. I just bought a Lexus uh, recently. I turned in my 12-year-old car. It was time. And I went to this dealer that's selling lease cars, I bought a two-year-old car with 22,000 miles on it, I saved 20 grand. Because the minute you roll off that lot, you lose 20%. Why would you take your money and put it somewhere where you lose 20% immediately? And I did a calculation, it's in the book, and it's probably the most important chapter in that whole book, is how to buy a car right. That over your car buying lifetime, you're going to buy about 10 to 15 cars. And I did a calculation, first year depreciation only. If you took that and put it in a savings account and got 5% over the course of your life, you would have a half a million dollars for retirement. Just avoiding new cars. It's that simple. Buying a new car is the worst thing you could do. And I say in the book, Detroit won't like me, but unless you're rich, you should never in your entire life ever buy a new car. Now, I could afford a new car. I could afford a new car every year. I don't buy them. I practice what I preach. And I tell you, I bought so many cars for clients and everything at this one dealership. You walk in, it's pristine. They have a certification on it. They put the NADA book value, and you pay $1,000 below it. No haggling, nothing. And you get a car that you think is new. It smells new. It looks new. If you didn't look at the odometer and saw it had 20,000 miles on it, you wouldn't know it wasn't new. That's the way to buy cars. Second thing we do wrong, too much house. As I said before, when I was growing up, eight of us lived in a small Cape Cod with one bathroom. Now a family of four lives in a McMansion with five bedrooms. Why is that stupid? 
Well, number one, it costs more, and the, the mortgage is more, the taxes are more, to heat it is more, to cool it is more, to maintain it is more, to insure it is more. Why? Can't we just have a house where we have bedrooms, a kitchen, a bathroom, and maybe a basement? No, because it comes back to the feelings of material entitlement that we have and financial irresponsibility. Now, we know what happened in the 2008 with the housing market, how it imploded. That's because Americans were buying too much house. And I knew the crisis was going to happen. I called the crash almost a year before it happened. And you know why? Because I had a client come to me. He was a postal, uh, a postal worker. He was buying a $750,000 house in central New Jersey. How can you do this, I said. He showed me the mortgage documents. No income verification, no money down. I said, you're nuts to buy this. And I knew at that point we were in trouble. Right? He bought it anyway, lost the house two years later, as did many, many, many Americans. Why? Because again, feelings of material entitlement. I want to live in this McMansion. I want to keep up with the Joneses. And we all paid the price for that. Cars and houses are the biggest thing. Let's talk about college. So many people come to me and they say, I want to start saving for college for my kid. How old is your kid? 14. All right, put $1,000 a month away, and maybe you could pay the first year and a half worth of college education. These things are, should be planned out as soon. As soon as you find out you're pregnant, you should start off 529 plan. Right? And if we had more time, I'd go into it. But uh, college, I was on uh, Fox Business a couple of years ago talking about college. And I said college is a scam. It's a scam. It goes up 8 9% a year when inflation goes up 1 or 2. Why is that? Because the government enables it by backing student loans. And how many kids are in trouble now with student loans? Because they're graduating with 50, 60,000 in student loans and can't find a job. Now granted, if you're going to be a lawyer or a doctor, you've got to go to college. But to go to college and get a Bachelor of Arts degree or a Liberal Arts degree, whatever it is, you're wasting your time and your money. You're better off starting your own business. And the, the real cost of college, if you think about it, is the cost of tuition plus all the interest on the student loans that you're going to pay over the course of 10, 15 years, and the lost wages for the four years you're partying in school. And you don't get life experiences. Even if you started a business and failed, you would have had a life experience. You'd be ahead of the person that's graduating college. So we could talk all day about college. It's right for the right people, right for the wrong people. But many people are broke because of college, not because of their own college, because of their kid's college because it stops being a college plan and a uh, problem and starts to become a retirement problem. Why? Because parents will mortgage their house again, put a second mortgage on it to pay for tuition, or co-sign the loans of their children. Because they can't get them by themselves, so somebody's got to co-sign for that. Now it becomes their liability, especially in this economy where kids are graduating and can't get a good job, and then the student loan payments kick in. It's a dreadful situation. My, my daughter graduated from college last week. And I was sitting in the stands watching these kids graduate and wondering how many hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt they all are, and how many of them are going to be successful and make a good living down the line. The last reason why people are broke, especially seniors, failure to downsize in retirement. Housing choices mean everything in retirement. The first thing I tell somebody, where are you going to live? What's your housing choice? An example is my parents. My parents uh, lived in the Cape Cod, I said. They were going to retire. My dad was going to get a decent pension, but he had a first mortgage, second mortgage, credit cards. We never had two nickels to rub together. My parents never had $1,000 in a bank. They had six hungry kids. My dad was a union printer. My mother was a waitress. Right? But we got by. But I told them, I said, look, you have a choice. You have enough money that you can stay in this house and live here, but you'll never leave it because you have no money to do anything else. I said, if you sell it, pay off all your debts, downsize to a small place in the retirement community, you'll have positive cash flow. And that's what they did. And for the first time in their life, they had money in the bank. For the first time in their life, they were able to go on vacations. Then I see clients that come to me, and they're living in the family house, just husband and wife, with five bedrooms in it. And I tell you, we go through a lot of Kleenex in my conference room, because especially widows, when I tell them I think they need to sell the house, it gets them all emotional. Their kids grew up there. They had their life with their husband and their spouse there. It's a, it's a, they have an emotional connection to it. And it's hard for them to sell that family house. But from a financial standpoint, it makes all the sense in the world. And when I tell people, look, you've got to downsize, they're reluctant at first to do it. 
but once we get on the other side of that, and they're in a smaller, more affordable home, now they finally feel some financial security in their life because they don't have ten, twelve thousand dollars a year going out in real estate taxes. Their utilities are down. The cost of insurance is down, and their overall cost of living goes down. And that's so important for people. Uh, and, and seniors right now, um, more and more seniors are broke now than ever before. Part of it is because of the foolish policies of the Federal Reserve that has interest rates at zero for five years. Here people expected to retire, get 5% on their CDs and live off that money, in addition to Social Security and pension, and now they get zero. So their money, their income, their retirement is being stolen away because of mistakes that their children made and their grandchildren made in speculating and buying homes that they couldn't afford and they're paying the price for it. It's a really sad story. I mean, uh, uh, I, I meet a lot with seniors and, and, and more and more now are very concerned uh, that they're going to be able to make it. And the other problem with seniors is inflation. The price of things that seniors buy is going up drastically. If you're making a half of 1% of your CD and your cost of living is going up 6 or 7% a year, you're in trouble. And that compounds on itself. And it's a shame, the situation that senior uh, Americans are in right now. It's amazing. And it's a sad story. And the problem that we have now, and I, as a person who manages money, most of my clients are seniors, 95%. I specialize in senior financial issues. I learned early in my career that the older people had all the money and that the younger people had all the debt. So if I'm going to get compensated based on how much money I manage, I was going to deal with seniors. And I learned a lot about them. And they were much better off 15 years ago when I was dealing with them than they are now for a lot of reasons. Real estate prices going down. And here's another gauge that's very, very concerning, is that last year my senior clients pulled more money out of their accounts to give to their adult children, to keep them in their homes. And it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm telling you, it was just off the chart last year. Off the chart last year. Uh, I'm also a tax accountant. I do most of my clients' income taxes, usually three, 400 tax returns a year. And that's when I have my meeting with my clients. And I ask them about their family and what's going on and so forth. And uh, I've never seen them so negative, so despondent, so, um, non-optimistic about their future, and more importantly, the futures of their children. And that's a sad commentary on the state of where we are in America. And I wish I could be a little bit more positive on this, but, but it is what it is. And many people, again, can avoid it. Now, I only went over about 10 of the reasons why most Americans are broke. In the book is 20. 20 things that Americans need to do. And I have a prescription on what to do for each one of those 20 financial ailments that we have. Um, also, I have a web page, uh, thefinancialphysician.com. I have a daily blog there. I archive all my radio shows uh, on there. Uh, I have some uh, uh, videos, things that are real interesting if you want to follow me and keep track on that. Uh, I have free books available. Anybody who wants one, just grab one and take one or see me in the back. And uh, briefly, if I could take a question or two, if anybody has one. All right, thank you. I appreciate you listening. Thank you very much.